our reading today comes from Jeffrey Herbert. This is New People Came This Time. New people came this time and we shared our stories, the familiar truths, the shock and healing and being glad that at last our children can say who they are and we know them now, love them more. Funny stories and good news ripple around and smiles about lesbian gay ways and jokes against ourselves taking the masks off to show the same donkey faces underneath, a communion of laughter. And several dawns once more lit up amongst, amongst us the sharpness of beginning sight, a slower sunrise over the years, other eye openings, painful or proud, all good. But this time, we nearly all wept wept with blinding new hurts, winced with what we thought had been healed, own old wounds waiting. We put the tissue box in the middle and passed it around, a communion of tears. We all wear masks at times in our lives and not just the ones that we have gotten used to more or less, on our faces in these last four and a half years. There are, of course, all kinds of masks, surgical, gas, Halloween, masquerade, sleep, clay, mud, and peel off facial masks, CPAP, ritual, and sock and buskin, the comedy and tragedy masks, symbolizing theater in, from ancient Greece. They serve all kinds of purposes, safety, health, fun, decoration, and more. Maybe you are familiar with Greek theater masks. It is believed that mask wearing in theatrical performances came from religious traditions of wearing masks in rituals honoring various gods. Eventually, this practice became connected with the god Dionysus. Dionysus is known by many as the god of wine, but this is a simplistic understanding. He was the god of transformation, so more accurately, he would have been the god of turning grapes into wine. Masks then empowered players, actors, to, de to demonstrate the act of transformation that characters often experienced over the course of plays, especially in tragedies, and for the actors to take on these roles. They were often large, which offered the benefit that people throughout the theater could see them better. The masks were often like helmets covering the head and then having enlarged features. Because of the way they were designed, they often allowed for some additional voice amplification. In massive theaters, some of which held upwards of 15 and 17,000 people at a time, these features were especially important. The expressions helped viewers identify the roles and characters that were being played and helped people follow the story better at times. Authors used this to their advantage to engage their characters in unexpected transformations. And another benefit of using masks was that they allowed different people to play different roles than they might have been able to otherwise. For example, they could easily portray another gender or age from what they were in their, in their lived lives. This also could allow the same actor to switch between characters in different scenes. This was very common as ensembles were often limited to three speaking players. I can't even imagine. <laughs> Where there were stable, stereotypical characters, masks could be reused among different performances so long as they lasted and helped orient people to who a character was without needing to give much introduction. Masks allowed for accessibility and flexibility in production in these ways. The use of masks like this relied on the actor to make the characters come to life. They would need to use their voices and bodies to convey themselves in a way that faces might typically have otherwise. Thinking of needing to tilt your head instead of being able to raise your eyebrows or gesturing instead of using a glance. 
Masquerade masks were also popular a couple of millennia later throughout Europe. It's believed that the practice of mask wearing also, this practice of mask wearing also came out of religious related traditions, those associated with the celebration of carnival. The practice goes back hundreds of years and was a public event marking the final days before Lent began, ending on Mardi Gras, also referred to as Shrill or Fat Tuesday. It was a time of celebration and partying with music, dances, performances, entertainment, gambling, and occasions for indulgence of both food and pleasure. Although at first carnival was only officially recognized on Mardi Gras, it was typically celebrated for at least two weeks before Lent began, and sometimes even from December 26th until Ash Wednesday. In Venice, carnival had significance not only for the festivities that took place, but because of the masks and costumes people wore as part of the celebrations. This was the one time of year every year that people of the lower classes were given freedom and anonymity to mingle with the upper classes, to mock authority and the aristocracy, and to bring a leveling to the social divisions that they were not otherwise entitled to. It was a time of fun and revelry and drew people from across Europe. Over time, the parties and performances became wilder. Another effect arose from what have become increasingly elaborate masking and costuming, the rise of crime, including theft, carrying weapons, and basically anonymous gambling, where unidentified people could game and be untraceable to their creditors. And Halloween too, of course, has its own history with masks, although much of what has been said about Mardi Gras and Carnival apply to Halloween here in the United States now, as those <clears throat> pre-Lenten holidays have decreased in their practice here. One of the slight variations on this is the obvious dressing up as hero or whatever feature that has become popular over the last few generations. But dressing up has a much longer and not as friendly history. Into the early 20th century, Christians wore masks and costumes on Halloween as a way to both ward off as well as engage with death and pagans have worn them as a way to ward off evil spirits. Like with the masquerades of Venice, people also use their masks and costumes to play tricks and pranks on each other. Crime during Halloween actually became so problematic at one point in the United States that parties and holidays began to be shut down until the time of, of about World War II when Halloween was re recast as a holiday for children. Over the course of the last century or so, Halloween has been amplified by U.S. American culture. While masks were previously intense and terrifying and utterly creepy, and not in the cool, creepy way that we've gotten to know them, but in like creepy, creepy ways, Google it, you'll see. They became more of an opportunity to be heroes, beginning with the likes of Mickey Mouse, Popeye and Olive Oil, and Little Orphan Annie. Some took the opportunity to bow experience what it was like to be on the margins, like homeless folks or pirates or any number of other identities. I have been struck at how often masks, mask wearing and costumes seem to correlate frequently with the bringing together of two worlds, between humans and gods, between different classes or parts of society, between life and death. Masks represent the power of either bringing an opposite closer or being able to pass onto the other side or letting the other side pass on to us. Halloween masquerades and other celebrations that have involved mask and costume wearing have a tradition of inviting us to consider ourselves as something or someone different, someone we admire maybe for one reason or another. Perhaps we admire their strength, their adventurousness, their wisdom, their humor. Having an opportunity to emulate our heroes can let us practice leaning into those qualities that we want to cultivate for ourselves. As if somehow taking on what another person's persona will give us more power to be like them, mixing that wonder and magic that has been part of mask wearing traditions for millennia. For some, Halloween, 
is a chance to turn convention and social norms on its head, which appeal very much to those who are on the margins. Those exploring their gender identities and sexualities were allowed this one night of the year to experiment and dream about their lives and their selves. Which begs the question, what are the masks all of us wear in our lives? When we celebrate holidays and occasions, we put on literal masks and costumes, but we often do this in our daily living as well, even if we don't think of it this way. We get dressed up in suits and ties, blouses and skirts, and head off to face a day in corporate America, a place that cultivates mask wearing like few other places in my experience, or some business or professional practice. We put on happy faces in our work environments. We keep seeking for wealth and status to keep up with the Joneses or the Kardashians or the Martha Stewarts or whoever else we're wanting to be like. These are all examples of mask wearing. Or we may be like Robin Williams, Marilyn Monroe, Anthony Bourdain, or any number of famous people who were brilliant and talented but struggled with mental health issues. They wore masks as best they could until it became too painful for them to continue. As Ram Das, a famous spiritual teacher and author said, in, our, in most of our human relationships, we spend much of our time reassuring one another that our costumes of identity are on straight. Many of us have been groomed to be this way from our earliest days, striving to live into the expectations or hopes or dreams that family or whoever had for us, to be like our parents in their professions, to become someone in a more valued profession, to have been a son or daughter, whichever one you weren't, and on and on. Mask wearing is often named by people with marginalized identities that they had to be in the closet or to pretend to be to not be gay or bi or trans or queer or whatever their sexual gender or affectional identities were, or they had to pass in, mid, in white middle-class culture, or they struggled with un- or misdiagnosed mental or other disabilities like PTSD or chronic illnesses. But this is many of us. Somehow we get overwhelmed with messages of shoulds and oughts and we become lost even to ourselves. This is compounded by younger folks by a poor economy that hasn't allowed the financial freedom or independence of past generations. And then suddenly or slowly or both as it sometimes happens, something will begin to shift, to change. Often is when we are suffering so much that we reach bottom and realize that how we were living made a shell of a person, that our lives were superficial and had no meaning. We realize that we've been chasing others' dreams or trying to escape so long that we don't even know what we're doing, what we're trying to get away from or where we're going. In some ways, those Hallmark holiday movies are true and that people leave their hometowns to try and make a life and find when the environment changes that they weren't really that happy, all that happy after all. So what then happens when the masks come off? Author and activist James Baldwin wrote that love takes off the masks that we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. I use the word he love here, not merely in the personal sense, but as a state of being, a state of grace, not in the infantile American sense of being made happy, but in the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth. Love for ourselves or love for others may propel us. It may be impossible to return to life as it was as we begin the work of discernment and coming to terms with who we are. We have to dig deep and be vulnerable and real, practice being the people we want to be. We begin the work of transformation, bringing ourselves closer to another part of us we want to show the world. While the masks we have may have allowed us some sense of power, of freedom, of adventure, it is when the masks come off, not unlike those of the mice in the story, that the work begins of building a life of meaning and purpose. 
whether it is by putting on or taking off the mask, may we discover who it was we were meant to be all along. Before we get to our closing hymn, I want to set aside just a few moments for those of us who perhaps like me are feeling that the veil has thinned like it does every year around this time. A few moments to acknowledge those we love who have passed beyond the veil. The people who perhaps made us feel like we didn't need to wear a mask or who taught us to take ours off by showing us how. I invite us to recall them now, those beloveds who once graced our lives, whom we miss, those whose lives made an impact on ours, of all of those who were once here and are now gone. Our memories may bring both joy and sadness and other emotions. Sit with them all. This is how we witness to the love of and in our lives by holding and sharing our memories. If you'd like. I invite you to come up to, one, to the table and light a candle. We don't have space or time for as many candles as we might all need, but if you would like to light one in memory of those that you have loved and lost, please come forward now. Terry is going to play some music, then I will say a short prayer, and we will sing our closing hymn. Spirit of life and love, who we know best through the acts of our own loving and being loved, hold us as we remember those we have loved and those who have loved us. May our gratitude sparkle in our lives. 
May our tears lubricate our souls. Help us as we know that we are not alone in our grieving and help us also to come to that peaceful place in which we can take what we learn from those who have gone before us into our own lives. Remind us that we too are mortal and that the only enduring legacy we leave is the love that shines through our lives. If you would please rise and lift your voice in song for our closing hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This? Mm -hmm. 